How much credit or blame do governors deserve for job growth? Why President Trump's energy independence executive order may not deliver as promised. The GOP failed at repealing Obamacare, but can they do anything about prescription drug prices? And Cabinet Secretary Elaine Chao, an outsider? Welcome to the Kentucky Gazette Podcast, Episode 110, the Commonwealth's podcast on state government, politics, and public affairs. I'm Laura Cullen Glasscock, editor and publisher of the Kentucky Gazette. I'm Leo Haggerty. Laura, let's jump right into the, uh, this week's episode from the front page, Economic Growth. How many jobs can a governor take credit for creating? In recent years, we've heard governors uh, right here in Kentucky, like Governor Bashir and Bevan, take credit for creating new jobs. But how much credit do they really deserve? We've also heard candidates say government doesn't create jobs. So what's the deal? Well, I think in, uh, in, the, in the notion of government doesn't create jobs, people who are small government types think that government gets in the way of private sector development is how I understand that premise from them. Um, The idea that the governor can or cannot create jobs has to do with the climate of a state, and a business climate in a state is reflected in many policies, tax policy, uh, right to work, which we saw just passed in this last uh, session of the General Assembly, things like that, Um, tax breaks, incentive programs. Kentucky gives away a lot of money, or I shouldn't say gives away, but it has a lot of... uh, Invests a lot of money. There you go. Invests a lot of money in its in trying to recruit businesses to the state. Um, in my view, it seems like uh, governors and no one in particular can take credit for for a lot of projects only by themselves because so many of these projects are um, many years in the making. I know when I worked at Toyota uh, Motor Manufacturing in Georgetown for a number of years, some of those projects literally took years in the making. And the Lexus that is coming online now, when I worked in the plant, I left in 2006, they were already working toward Lexus quality. Lexus quality is something we heard over a decade ago while we were there. So to say that a governor can bring in jobs based on one policy or another, I think that's a little misleading. It does make for good campaigning. Well, and there's also, quite like you mentioned with a question with timing, I know uh, President Trump, which, who isn't a governor, but was taking credit for job numbers that really reflected things that had happened months before he was even sworn sure. in. So, I mean, you know, at what point can it really be the elected officials claim? Would, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I think it would depend on the project and the scope of the project. I think governors can harm um, and legislatures can do harm, though. We saw that in North Carolina with their House Bill, too, that yeah. harmed the business uh, climate. So, On to page three. On March 28th, President Trump, surrounded by coal miners, signed the Energy Independence Executive Order, which, among other things, scraps the Obama-era Clean Power Plan, which calls on states to reduce electric utility emissions. He also told miners this. Basically, you know what this says? You know what it says, right? You're going back to work. (laughs) You're going back to work. So is it that easy? Is it that simple to undo 40 years of clean air and clean water laws and regulations? And will it put miners here in Kentucky and other states back to work? Well, that's a that's a good question, and I think in some ways it it depends on your political philosophy for some people how that's answered. A lot of people are hoping that the new Republican administration, majority in Congress, can put miners back to work. But a lot of people are saying that it's not just the regulations, that the EPA regs and those types of state regs that are that cause the problems, that well, there's market sector. Even, uh, yeah, even um, uh, Senator McConnell and Nick Carter from the Kentucky Coal Association have said that economic factors are going to play a much greater role. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. But, uh, but, but back to the, the, the initial subject about the... Uh, but e- in eastern Kentucky, yeah, there's, there's several other things that have influenced it too, Leo. The Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, has determined, uh, or they affirmed a view, and they have in the past, that CO2 and other gases, what we call greenhouse gases, um, do trap heat and are pollutants and therefore can be regulated as such. Um, also, there's the Paris Agreement that the United States has signed on to, and that's an international agreement. It, it's 
would be hard to undo it, maybe not legally, but the PR ramifications would be bad and could be detrimental uh, globally because of the um, how it would affect other countries. They would look at us maybe and say, well, if the U.S. isn't doing it, they're huge polluters. Why do we have to do it? Well, and the other ramifications in terms of international p- diplomacy, if the mm-hmm. U.S. is going to scrap this deal, well, can they be trusted to do other deals in the future? Sure. And then can other people scrap if the deal? So, and then there's a third element, too, with the coal regulations, and that is that to undo regs, there are some, I think, the president can do an, or undo with the executive order, but others would require public comment, and that can be a lengthy process as well. So it wasn't as simple as it may have seemed, but that is a road that we're heading down at that point. It at this looks point. like it. Okay. Sure looks like it. Back in episode 108, it seems like it was a lifetime ago, mm-hmm. we discussed the proposed Trump administration budget for 2018. One of the things you mentioned at the time was proposed cutting for the funding of the arts. On page five of this issue, there is an article about what the budget could mean for the arts and humanities. Yeah, and it's interesting that people want to cut it, and I think that the discussion around those kinds of cuts maybe makes people think it's more than it is, but that cutting the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting um, would only cut point... 0.2% of the federal budget, which is next to nothing. Combined, it's about um, 500, not even $600 million for all three of those entities. And and the United States actually has one of the smallest percentages of money going to the arts of any of the industrialized Mm -hmm. countries in the world. Right. And, And I get the argument, too, that people say that art can be controversial. And so should someone have to pay for... Um, Art that they don't believe. That they don't that, like or yeah. that if offend, offends their sensibility. Mm-hmm. But um, so, you know, there are two sides to it. And, and would private industry or private enterprise donors, private donors step up to support the arts? You know, that's, I think, what, what some of the Trump administration folks are thinking would happen. Now, I haven't heard any of the, anything about this yet. Have you heard, has NPR donations gone up since... I don't know. I haven't heard about that, but I know for Planned Parenthood and some other organizations that are facing cuts, uh, donations have gone up. That's what made me wonder, because uh, I remember reading that, I believe, in the Gazette not too long ago. I don't know. Maybe that's a listener question, a Leo question that needs to be answered. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Let's move on now. Oh, and don't forget, as we were talking about the budget, that the full copy of the president's budget is available on our website at www.kentuckygazette.com. So you can take a peek at that uh, for some light bedtime reading. Yeah. Download it. (laughs) On to the opinion section in page six. Now, uh, this week you wrote a very personal experience uh, and uh, added a call to Congress to do something about prescription drug prices. I did. I was with a friend running errands not too long ago, and she needed to drive through the pharmacy and pick up a prescription, and the pharmacist said it was $102. And I said, ask how much if you don't use your insurance, because she has Medicare. She's an older lady. And, and uh, so she asked, and it was $47 if she paid herself, so less than half. Wow. And if you start thinking about that, part of it is, you know, she won't u- be able to use that $47 toward her deductible, so that kind of mm. hurts. But that's really a convoluted system in that people who have this insurance pay one price, someone who has that insurance pays another, and if you pay yourself, it's even less. Now, this is a different scale, but I, I recently went to pick up my allergy medicine at uh, the pharmacy, and I get it 30 days at a time using my health mm-hmm. insurance, and I'm very fortunate to have a very good health insurance plan. And uh, the girl said, well, you know, I could give you the, the one month for, the, for the, your $5 copay, or I could give you thirty day, uh, ninety days worth, mm-hmm. and it'll cost you seven dollars. Right. I'm like, that makes no sense to me, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And why? Why is it so convoluted? I mean, I don't know. I did some research on this specific thing to this spe- for the specific uh, editorial I wrote, but it's it's massive. I mean, it's just a huge problem. One thing I did find, Leo, in researching. Uh, doing research for this editorial was a report by a guy named Austin Fract, and he compared Medicare uh, d- 
drug pricing and coverage with the VA, the Veterans Administration, and the VA handles things much differently, and they're allowed to negotiate. And what it comes down to really is that Congress has prohibited Medicare, the Medicare program, from negotiating drug prices with pharmaceutical companies. The VA doesn't have that restriction, so they can get lower prices. Now, they don't cover as many co um, drugs on their formulary list, but there's still ways to work around that from, from what I understand. Okay. Moving on and staying within the opinion section, we're on to page seven now, and Anna Bauman from the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy with Trump budget would hurt Kentucky. Yes, according to the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy, uh, Kentucky would lose $100 million, $190 million in the first year of the budget. I believe I'm recalling that correctly. And Kentucky gets 37% of its state uh, spending comes from the feds, from the federal government. And that compares with 31% on average for other states. So cut, cuts to programs would hurt Kentucky significantly more than others. And some of that would include cuts to or the dissolution of the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is on President Trump's uh, 86 list. So, But as we also mentioned in the last episode that we talked about this, I guess episode 108, Senator McConnell and other members of the uh, Kentucky congressional delegation have signaled that they're not supportive of all of the cuts proposed. So just because it's proposed in the president's budget doesn't necessarily mean that it's ever going to become That's law. That's right. The budget has to come out of the U.S. House first. So, And it's, it's, a, it's a policy document as much as anything else. But, and, you know, I may have misspoken. It may be that the, f the federal spending that Anna mentioned in her column did not include those cuts. It may have just been the regular um, entitlement, Medicare, Medicaid, type spending is what she was referring to. Well, that's a good reason for people to read the Gazette and find out more details. <laughs> Since I can't memorize it every <laughs> week. <laughs> okay, we're going to stay on page seven, but go to the right column. No accident there that you've got Jim on the right and Anna on the left, I don't no, think. No, it's my own little personal pun. Okay. Uh, Jim Waters, president of the Bluegrass Institute on Public Policy Solutions, with a Shakespearean take on an Amish farmer salve. That's right, Leo. A farmer in Bath County named Sam Jared has uh, made a salve out of organic farm products, and he labeled it that it was a healing skin product. And the FDA found out about it. The Federal Drug Food and Drug Administration found out about it, and they sued him, uh, saying that he had to change the labeling because there was no proof that it would heal. And so he changed the label according to Jim Waters three times, but still was uh, charged with violations. And he is uh, goes to court on June in June, middle mid June, and is looking at a 48 year sentence for mislabeling um, a, a skincare product. So it's pretty uh, seems pretty draconian. Uh, hopefully mm. he has good lawyers. Um, but yeah, that's. It'll be interesting to see how, just how that yeah, plays we'll have out. To keep an eye on that. So moving on, my wife and I are both big readers, and there are several genres that we agree on and we both enjoy. But biographies, especially history and presidential bio biographies, I love and she can't stand. So I was excited, at least, to see that the book review on page nine, Richard Nixon, The Life by John A. Farrell. And I've got to admit, I'm a little embarrassed. I have never read a, a, a Nixon biography, but having lived through that and remembering a lot of it, I don't, I was young, but I, I'm, I remember a lot of it. I just have never felt the need, but I think I might actually pick this up and see uh, see it, what they've got to say. It's supposed to be really good. The book reviewer called it very a, fair, a very fair presentation of President Nixon, and John Farrell, the author, um, didn't seem to lean one way or the other in, in his own politics and covering it, but he looked really closely at what did the president know and when did he know it, that cliched phrase that, you know, it's a trope now, mm -hmm. but back then it was, it was the crux of the, the, uh, it, the um, scandal. Okay, moving on. Actually, we're going to loop back to page one in the notes and quotes area. And I found this interesting. The wife of Kentucky senior senator, Senator Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who is also a two-time cabinet secretary, Elaine Chow, recently talked about feeling like an outsider. 
Yes, um, Elaine Chao, who, as we know, is the transportation secretary in the Trump administration, was a was the labor secretary under President George W. Bush, and so she's kind of a Washington insider. But she and her family emigrated here from Taiwan when she was a little girl, like seven, eight, nine years old. And so just coming and having that immigrant experience was something that she, you know, that shaped her worldview, of course, and has kept her, as she said in an interview with USA Today, which we cited, um, that she kind of felt like a little bit of an outsider. But she also said she was able to use that experience to to discuss with the Trump administration some Im- views on immigration. So when that policy becomes more firm, and maybe we'll see that um, Secretary Chow's had a hand in forming that policy as well. Also in this issue of the Kentucky Gazette, Teacher Retirement Executive Director Gary Harbin gets his headline. Yes, I got a newsletter from the Kentucky Teacher Retirement uh, System, and there was, a, there was the president's column, or the executive director's column, and Gary Harbin said, too bad no reporters, no one gave us a headline because it was good news that the KTRS, the funding is, the um, their funds are making money in the market now. And so after I read that, I thought, well, that is pretty interesting. That's pretty good news. So here you go, Mr. Harbin, here's your headline. So I'm sure you'll see it because he subscribes. Also in the Gazette, celebrating a common humanity during Poetry Month. Bill Straub on Planned Parenthood and not letting facts get in the way. And Kentucky Projects, a little something for everyone. Now on to listener questions, which is quickly becoming one of my favorite and more amusing uh, uh, parts of the show. Uh, This one comes from Jack in Louisville. Jack says, I was trying to get my 11-year-old son to read the newspaper recently good work, Jack. I mean, I yeah, think we should exactly. give Jack a pat on the back for that. And he told me, Dad, it's all just opinions. I tried to explain the difference between reporting, op-ed, and columns, and I have to admit I got a little confused. Can you clarify it for me so that I can explain it to him later? Time for you to put your professorial hat on, there pro- you go. Pro- Professor. That is a good question, and a lot of people are confused about that. And I think it's partly because we use words interchangeably that in the news business we don't use interchangeably. So when we say we report a story, that means that we as reporters, as journalists, under a code of ethics that we all agree on, good journalists agree on anyway, we go and we report a story. We tell what happened and we try as hard as humanly possible to keep our own biases out of it. We're trained to look for facts and we're trained to recognize when biases might creep in. An op-ed piece is an editorial written usually by someone who's not on the newspaper staff. So it's someone who submits something to a newspaper in hopes of it being published to further public discussion of an issue. Now, maybe I'm showing my ignorance here, but isn't there also like the Courier Journal has an editorial board or you as the publisher or Mm -hmm. the publisher of the state journal does op-ed pieces as well? Well, usually those are not op-ed. Those are editorials. Editorials, okay, which is something different. And those are staff-written. Okay. So the Gazette's editorial page, for example, I usually write the editorial, or we have a guest editorial writer, but that is, those are written and edited by staff of the paper. It's kind of a voice that the paper wants to share with the community. The Gazette's editorial page, too, by the way, is we're we're very moderate, we're good government um, type of, of uh, editorial stance. We don't swing too far to the left or too far to the right. We don't editorialize on social issues. You won't see an issue on uh, an editorial on gay marriage in the Gazette, for example. Might run an op-ed on it, but we we won't cover that. So op-ed pieces are written by people who are not on the newspaper staff, and they write them on occasion to maybe uh, get involved in public discourse. So on, on occasion you see something from We've had uh, op-ed pieces from Tamara Sandberg, for example. She's with the Food Bank, Kentucky Food Bank Association. So she might just once a year, a couple times a year, um, sporadically write an op-ed piece. And then there are columnists, and there are different columnists. Most people think of sports columnists. You know, Mm -hmm. that's real common. And those are people who write a regular column that shows up 
in the same place, same time, almost every publication date or now, or scheduled date. An, an so example of this would be the, with the Courier Journal, Joe Girth, mm-hmm. who was a reporter, mm-hmm. yes. who who wrote stories about news happening. Mm-hmm. And recently, Joe became a columnist, and so he's now writing, still writing for the, the Courier, but he's writing columns. And columns are a little more opinionated or analytical. They're still based on reporting, so you still have to gather your facts, do your interviews, and you know, and, and do your legwork to get the information. And it's a little more that it does have more perspective in it instead of having. A regular news story where you have he said she said they said the official word is all combined in one story the and you try to keep all perspectives equal so to speak um, something like what Joe is doing is uh, can have the, uh, his own perspective in it because it's labeled as a column with his name on it and we'll find out more about that in a couple of weeks because Joe has agreed to be a guest on the podcast nice segue Leo thank you thank you very much Okay, so um, that takes care of our question of the week. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can submit one by emailing me, leo at Kentucky, all spelled out, gazette.com. You can also go to the website, www.kentuckygazette.com, and use our Contact Us form, or you can call 502-783-6407 and leave a voicemail message. Each episode, will answer one question, and if we don't know the answer, we'll get an answer from an expert in the field. If you'd like to read more about the stories we discussed today, you can read the full articles and the rest of the Kentucky Gazette by subscribing. It's easy to subscribe. Just go to www.kentuckygazette.com slash subscribe. And if you haven't visited our website in a while, please check it out, www.kentuckygazette.com. Uh, we post breaking news there and information that, that often doesn't make it into the printed edition of the Gazette. To stay up to date on what's going on in Frankfurt and D.C. between podcast and issues of the Gazette, you can follow us on Twitter at Kentucky Gazette or on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash Kentucky Gazette. We also invite you to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. And if you're enjoying the podcast, leave us a good review. Also coming soon, YouTube and Google Play Music. That'll do it for this episode of the Kentucky Gazette Podcast. Thanks for listening. The Kentucky Gazette Podcast is a production of the Kentucky Gazette. Copyright 2017, Gravel Switch Publishing. The podcast is produced in the studios of TCHQ Communications in Frankfort, Kentucky. Thank you for listening.